Hello and welcome to my video depicting the surgical extraction of an uncooperative lower left canine tooth in a mature cat. In this preoperative photograph we can see significant coronal damage to the lower left canine tooth and in a cat such damage is almost certainly going to involve pulp exposure and therefore endodontic disease. The lower right canine also has some minor damage but it was deemed to be irrelevant on clinical and radiographic examination. And here's a lateral view of that lower left canine tooth showing the coronal damage. In this preoperative radiograph, the canine on the left side of the screen is the lower right canine, and it appears radiographically normal. The canine on the right side of the screen is the fractured lower left canine tooth. You can see the pulp chamber is larger overall, quite a bit wider down at the root tip, and in this lateral view, we can see that the apex is being destroyed and that there's an indistinct periodontal ligament space. These radiographic features all confirm that this tooth has been dead for quite some time and there's been chronic apical periodontitis, chronic inflammation resulting from septic pulp necrosis. You can read more about endodontic disease by going to my website, navigating to the Old Cusp Articles page and checking out the section entitled Endodontic or Pulp Disease. At this point, I have my diagnosis. The tooth has endodontic disease and apical pathology, and it requires extraction. It's not a candidate for root canal treatment. But just for fun, I'm attempting to see if I can find actual gross pulp exposure. I've probed the tooth with a dental explorer, could not get the instrument into the opening. I'm now trying a very fine endodontic file, it's six one hundredths of a millimeter at the tip, and I cannot get it into the pulp chamber. So in this particular tooth, there was no direct pulp exposure, just a near pulp exposure. And since dentin is porous, that was more than enough to allow bacteria to get inside to kill the tooth. The first step in extracting this tooth is to reflect a full thickness mucoperiosteal flap to get the soft tissue out of the way so it can be protected for wound closure and to allow removal of bone. I'm using a Syslac EX7 periosteal elevator that has been sharpened many, many times. We sharpen our instruments after every use. You can see that the blade is widest at the tip and gets narrower as we move up towards the handle. And so with each sharpening, not only does the blade get a little bit shorter, it also gets a little bit narrower. So a brand new EX7 would be much wider at the, in, at the working end than this particular instrument is. And so at this point, this one has gotten down to a size that it's appropriate for use in a cat's mouth for elevating the flap around the canine tooth. The instrument is kept so sharp that I can use it to make the incision as well as for reflecting the flap. You can see I'm keeping my finger very close to the tip to maintain good control over where the instrument goes. I'm being very careful to elevate the soft tissue off the bone without lacerating or macerating that soft tissue because as I mentioned, I'm going to need that tissue in order to close the wound at the end of the procedure. The end of the periosteal elevator has a gentle curve down towards the bone to make sure that I'm getting all of the soft tissue off the bone and reducing the risk of perforating and lacerating the soft tissue. I'll tell you now that it took me roughly 20 minutes to elevate the flap, remove the tooth, take my post-operative and intraoperative radiographs and suture the wound closed. Now I want to get the gingiva away from the canine tooth. I want to try and preserve the gingiva around the third incisor because my hope is to leave that in place. Now I'm elevating the gingiva and the soft tissue away from the bone on the lingual aspect of the tooth in order to gain access to the bone there and be able to work around this tooth around its entire circumference. Just about satisfied with my flap now, removing just a little bit more of the muscle from the bone, and soon we'll start some bulk bone removal. I've selected a number four surgical length carbide burr for some bulk bone removal here on the labial aspect of the canine tooth. This is a round carbide burr in a high speed hand piece with water being sprayed at the, at the burr to keep things cool.
Now I've switched to a number one half round carbide burr to start drilling my moat around the tooth between the root and the bone. This is to facilitate inserting an instrument between the root and the bone to elevate the tooth out and also just reducing the amount of surface area that this tooth is attached to. I use this moating technique quite commonly. Rather than removing a lot of the alveolar plate, I'd rather just drill a small moat around the tooth. Um, I feel this, this weakens the jaw less than removing large quantities of bone and exposing the root more, uh, more dramatically. Moating is useful to start extractions of large teeth where the periodontal ligament space is very narrow and wouldn't um, allow the entrance of a, a dental elevator. It's also great for removing retained root remnants when teeth fracture during the procedure. Now I've selected an appropriately sized and shaped and very sharp dental elevator and I'm going to start working on trying to elevate this tooth out. Despite the radiographic signs, I'm still somewhat hopeful that I might be able to get this tooth out intact in one piece. And so I'm working at elevating the tooth, working circumferentially around the tooth to try and start breaking down the periodontal ligament, loosening the root up. Given that this is a tooth with endodontic disease, it's got a contaminated root and septic inflammation around the root tip, this is a situation in which we can leave no remnant of the root behind. This tooth needs to be extracted completely. Uh, if it comes out in one piece, fantastic. If it breaks down, we have to go and get all of the remnants out. This is absolutely not a situation in which we can allow for any uh, intentional root remnant retention um, or even unintentional root remnant retention. This tooth has to be removed completely. I want to look at some other radiographs for a minute in relationship to how poorly they can predict the likelihood of being able to get a tooth out in one piece. These upper canine teeth in, a, in another cat were in an obvious advanced state of resorption. The apical half of the roots are very visible, so it seemed very unlikely that these teeth were going to come out intact. Much more likely the top half of the root would come away with the crown and the apical half of the root would stay in the socket and require excavation to remove it. Regardless of those radiographic signs, in this case I reflected my flaps as usual and started to try and elevate the teeth out and was both surprised and thrilled that both of those upper canine teeth came out in one piece. So even though the radiographs may suggest there's no chance a tooth's going to come out intact or in one piece, I always like to give it a shot and sometimes I'm rewarded for my efforts. On the other hand, sometimes we'll have radiographs that suggest there's no reason at all for the tooth to break and yet it stubbornly and steadfastly refuses to come out in one piece, continuing to crumble and break down. So, as essential as intraoral dental radiographs are for treatment planning and diagnosis, they do have their limitations, and one of those is they don't always accurately predict how well a tooth is going to uh, cooperate with regard to being extracted. In this particular instance, as I said, the radiograph suggested that we might get the tooth out in one piece, but as you can see from the the amount of time it's taking me to work on elevating and not getting much motion, not getting, making much headway here, um, this is a tooth that's starting to act like it's not going to come out intact. The challenge with extracting any tooth in general, and certainly a large tooth in particular, is that uh, we have to apply sufficient force to loosen the tooth up and get it from the socket. But particularly in the instance of the lower canine teeth in cats, we have to be careful not to apply so much force that instead of moving the tooth, we end up fracturing the jaw. And of all the iatrogenic jaw fractures uh, that occur during tooth extraction, I would say the cat lower canine tooth is the one most likely to result in a crack or a fracture through the socket. So we have to be willing to apply enough force to get the tooth to move, but have to have controlled force and be very cautious to not fracture the jaw in the process. At this point I felt I was getting some movement from the tooth and I felt that there was a possibility I could apply a little rotational force or a little torsion 
um, on the tooth and continue to loosen the periodontal ligament in that fashion and get the tooth out. So I was applying my forceps there, wasn't making any headway, didn't, wasn't getting any movement of the tooth. So here we go back to the number one half round carbide burr, removing a little bit more bone, really not trying to, re trying not to remove the labial plate, but creating a deeper moat around the tooth. Again, surgically removing or breaking down the attachment between the root and the bone, decreasing the amount of surface area that is holding that tooth in place. I'm going to go back and do a little bit more elevating, continuing to work away. Now, some people would say that I could have done this whole thing a lot faster if I just laid back a huge flap initially, removed all of the labial alveolar plate, and scooped the root out. Um, I prefer to start conservatively and frequently I'm rewarded in those efforts. I get the tooth out with very minimal flap and minimal bone removal and it's a much quicker procedure if I do it that way and then closure is quite rapid. Um, if that conservative approach doesn't work then I get a little more aggressive. So I've removed some more bone, I've molded some more, I've elevated some more and now the forceps are back on the tooth starting to get some movement. I'm thinking, okay, maybe we're going to get this tooth out now. But unfortunately, all I got out was the crown and about the top half of the root. And much of the root has remained inside the socket. So now we're going to have to move over to surgical removal of these root remnants. The root separation was rather oblique. There's more of the lingual surface of the root still in the socket. There it is. Um, I'm able to elevate out that chunk and it just went flying off into the distance. Now we have the apical, probably the apical third of the root still in place. And in order to visualize the separation between root and bone more clearly and see the interface between the two so that I can continue to moat around them, I'm going to be using a, a burr shortly to um, smooth down the root and the bone. I'm not trying to drill the root away just trying to create a smoother surface and uh, in doing this it makes it more visually apparent what is root and what is bone. I'm using a little blast of water to flush away debris and now I've got my number one half round burr again and I can continue to work my moting action around that root remnant which is clearly visible to me with my headlight and magnification. Now, I hope you're able to see it on your screen as well. So I do a little moting around the root, working my way down deeper into the socket, uh, always being cognizant to try and remove as little bone as possible. I'm still concerned about the potential for fracturing the jaw through the socket. So I'm trying to preserve as much of the bone as I can and maintain as much integrity and strength of the mandible while still achieving the objective of getting rid of this um, rather persistent and stubborn root. Moted as far as I dare, so now it's back to the elevator to try and excavate out the remainder of this root tip. And at this point, I'm pretty sure it's just going to keep crumbling and cracking. But sometimes they they will just the apex will just pop out. Um, this one's not doing that. It's it's continuing to break down and crumble and come out in little bits and pieces. And I'm going to spare you some of this by editing out a minute or two of my excavation and elevation. And now I'm getting pretty close to the point where I can no longer see anything that looks like root. As I look down in the socket it all just looks like bone to me. So we're, we're going to take a radiograph and judge our progress, see how we're doing. The socket looks largely empty but right along the, the uh, ventral border near the apex I'm still seeing something that looks like it is probably some root remnant um, lying against the alveolar wall and that would be contaminated. I want to I want to get that out. So back we go. Now that I know what it is I'm looking for and where it's located, I can target my excavation more accurately and I think I'm seeing what it was that was showing up on the x-ray and uh, again keeping in mind that we're always using very sharp elevators sharpen our instruments after every procedure. So at this stage I'm able to get that very sharp edge in between the 
root remnant and the surrounding bone. And I think we're getting the last little remnant there starting to loosen up. I'm really starting to think I've got it just about all gone at this point. So we're going to take one last look and then it'll be time for another radiograph to see if I'm satisfied. Now, when the root tip has been broken down by chronic inflammation and resorption, and there's ankylosis, it can be difficult to know for sure when all of the root is gone. But in looking at this post-operative radiograph, I was satisfied that I had removed everything that I needed to remove, and that it was now time to um, debride the socket of any, any remaining fragments or debris, loose floating debris, and make sure it filled up with a good blood clot, and then start closing the wound in my usual fashion, which um, involves uh, reflecting the flap a bit more, making sure that we can get good tension-free closure. So I'm going to undermine the flap a little bit more on both the labial and the lingual sides. Um, I didn't do this at the beginning of the procedure. I like to keep my flaps conservative initially, leave the soft tissue on the bone uh, during the extraction phase if I can, and then elevate or undermine the flap for closure at the end of the procedure. And I think that means we're going to get less debris down underneath the flap and we have less bone exposure during the procedure for it to become desiccated. Now I'm going to smooth down the top of the socket a little bit. Just take off any sharp edges. This is known as alveoloplasty. Um, smooth down the, the top edges of the alveolar crest so that the flap is lying on a smoother, flatter layer of bone. And after doing a bit of that, we'll um, again cure it out to remove any bone dust or little bits of debris. Undermine the flap a little bit more. There I'm using the periosteal elevator turned around with the curve out towards the soft tissue to incise the periosteum on the inside of the flap and give myself more, mo more mobility. And now we're going to start suturing the wound. I'm using a 5 aught monocryl on a P3 needle and I'll be using a Ford interlocking pattern which is my go-to pattern for almost all of my surgical procedures. It's faster than simple interrupted, it leaves fewer knots in the mouth, um, and it works well for me. The main advantage to me is uh, that it's, it's considerably faster than doing simple interrupted. When closing a wound um, after an extraction, I usually like to put my first suture um, to make sure that I oppose the gingiva around a tooth that was adjacent to the extraction site. In this instance, the third incisor was very close to the canine tooth, and so it's the one that's had its gingival attachment disrupted more than any other. So my first suture is intended to bring the gingiva and wrap it nicely around that third incisor, reestablish a good intact gingival collar for that uh, remaining tooth, the tooth that was immediately adjacent to the extraction site. So I've got the first suture in and the knot tied off. Now we'll take another bite, labial and lingual. Uh, loop the suture through itself to create that first interlocked loop. And then in a case like this where we have a fairly short incision, there'll be a suture mesially, one in the middle, and then just one more bite probably at the distal aspect. And then we'll tie off and, and be done. So I'm placing now the the third suture at the distal aspect, again getting labial and then lingual, and tightening things down, making sure that we've got uh, even tension across all. It looks like we're going to put one more suture in at the very distal end, so it turns out in this instance we had four sutures. <laughs> 
So I've sutured the wound and tied off the last knot. And we'll just do a good visual inspection, make sure that the wound edges are close together and that there's no, no problems with the wound closure. And then here's a final post-operative photograph of that wound closure. So there was the extraction of a partially resorbed and partially ankylosed left mandibular canine tooth in a cat, an extraction that caused some fr frustration and was a little bit challenging, but um, with persistence and appropriate technique, we were able to get all of the tooth out without any um, undue trauma to the patient and with no uh, serious complications. So I hope you found that of some value to you. Thank you very much for watching.